Callie. If you have your Bible or your phone, I want you to go to Genesis chapter 3. Uh, while you're turning there, I want to say a thank you on behalf of our uh, staff. Last week at the end of the, the second service, the elders gave us a gift for uh, Ministry Appreciation Month. And we want you to know we don't take that for granted. We are thankful. And uh, more than that, we're thankful uh, for you all and thankful and honored uh, to be here. So just want you to know that. Uh, if, if you know me, um, you know I, I'm not, for the most part, a, uh, a gloom and doom type person. Uh, like everybody else, you know, I have my moments, but for the most part, I try to keep a, a fairly positive outlook. But I don't know how it is for you, but over the last year, year and a half, if, if I start to watch the news too much, it starts to affect my attitude. Anybody, uh, anybody had an experience like that? Uh, Bob Russell said the best thing he'd done over the last two years was he limits himself to 15 minutes of news per day. He feels like 15 minutes is enough to get the basics without being obsessed with it or listening to endless commentary about everything that's going on. And I agree with that. I, mean, I don't know how it is for you, but if I watch the news for very long, it really starts to get me down. And you think, well, you know, why wouldn't it? You think about we, we, the last few days we've read about a, a 13-year-old girl whose parents were murdered and now she's been missing for two weeks. You see images of a caravan of thousands of migrants heading north and nobody knows what to do about it. Um, you read about a journalist who was brutally murdered by an oppressive regime, and the more you read, the more questions you have. Then if that wasn't enough, you read about pipe bombs being sent through the mail to political leaders. Um, you open up the Herald Leader, you read about somebody being shot at Fayette Mall. Uh, you open up the Courier Journal, it's two people killed inside of a Kroger store in Louisville. If you turn the news on yesterday, you saw the story about a an anti-Semitic uh, madman walk into a synagogue with a high-powered rifle and kill 11 people. And I don't know how it is for you, but when I turn on the news at night, it's like they say, here's everything bad that happened, here's how it's going to get worse, and here's the weather forecast. And at the end, they smile at you and say, now have a great night. And I don't know how it is for you, but when I watch the news, I don't feel much like having a great night. I feel more like digging a hole and, and crawling in it. And what happens is, every time you watch the news, it's, a, it's an illustration, it's an example that something has gone wrong. And everybody, most for the most part, would agree with that. They may debate what's gone wrong, they may debate the causes and the solutions, but almost everybody agrees that something has gone terribly wrong in the world. If you have your Bible, open to Genesis 3. This morning, we're continuing our series, Old School, and we're looking at some things that everybody used to believe but has sort of gotten away from. Last week, we talked about the story of creation, and we talked about how it was God himself who created the world. Uh, so if you know, you're you not just some random accident of nature, uh, you've been purposely and wonderfully created by God. And you get to the end of Genesis 2, where we left off last week, and it's a world in, in perfect harmony. The Hebrew language has a word for it. It's the word shalom. It's a word that means peace and, and wholeness. And that's the world that God created. He creates this, this perfect garden. He puts this man and this woman, and he puts them together in the garden. And it's, it's a beautiful picture of what life was supposed to be like. They get along with each other. There's no shame. There's no regret. There's no death. There's no sickness. There's no pain. It's life as it was meant to be. The problem is that it doesn't last very long. You turn over to Genesis 3, and I told you last week, the first three chapters of Genesis are kind of like the, the story that explains everything. They tell us where we came from, tells us why we're here, and then you get to chapter 3, and it tells us why everything is, is so messed up. What you see when you turn on the news at night is the opposite of a world at peace. It's a world at, at war. It's the opposite of shalom. It's the opposite of, of the garden. It's, it's, it's pain, it's tension, it's regret, it's shame, it's guilt, it's, it's conflict. And the question is, what happened? How do we get from this, this perfect creation to where we are now? Well, Moses, the writer of Genesis, gives us the answer in Genesis 3, and here it is. Sin messed everything up. 
God created a perfect world. Sin comes in and, and messes it up. There's not one part of the world that's not been stained, corrupted, distorted, and damaged because of sin. And not only does it affect the world around us, it also affects us. And here's what you learn. The, the, the closer that you try to follow Jesus, the more you discover that it's not just the world that's messed up, it's your heart that's messed up. See, it's easy to flip through the channels and watch TV and watch the news and think, man, this world is a jacked up place. But it's a little harder to look in the mirror and think, my heart's a messed up place. And yet, the closer you start to follow Jesus, the more you'll see just how deeply sin has affected us. Romans 7, the Apostle Paul says it like this. A lot of us here can identify with this statement. Here's what he says. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Paul's just like a certain things he wanted to do, good things in his life. He, he wanted to be better. He wanted to be good. But over time, he found himself inexplicably being drawn to that which was wrong. You ever been there? You ever caught yourself doing something crazy, and in a moment of clarity, you tell yourself, I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to tell another lie. I'm never going to go back to that website. I'm never going to talk to that person. Uh, I'm never going to lie on my expense report. I'm never going to take that substance again. And in the moment, you really mean it. But then a few days later, maybe even a few hours later, you find yourself doing it all over again. And the question is, why is that? Well, Genesis 3 gives us the answer. All of us here have been infected with a deadly virus called sin. Genesis 3, the opening paragraph, what you find is a conversation that literally changed the course of history. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you'll die. Verse 4, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So you're like me, you read this, and you probably have a lot of questions uh, where did the serpent come from? How long after creation did all of this happen? And the big one, of course, is how did the serpent communicate with the woman? Uh, I've got this dog at home. I meant to bring a picture and I forgot. I've had him now for 10 years. His name is Patch. And uh, over those 10 years, uh, we've sort of developed a way of communicating. And you probably have experienced this with your animals. Uh, like if he's hungry, he knows that all he has to do if he's hungry is he goes and he stands next to the cabinet where we keep the food, and eventually somebody will pick up on that and feed him. If he has to go out, you know, he goes and stands by the door until somebody takes him out. Uh, if he's ready to go to bed at night, now that he's getting a little older, you know, that, that's a little earlier than everybody else, he will literally stand and stare at you until you get up and take him and put him in his house. That's just what he does. So over these 10 years, we, we've developed this way of communicating, but I can tell you, we, we've never had an in-depth conversation. Now, I've tried some sermon illustrations out on him a time or two, but, but he never responds much. You know what I mean? Uh, we don't really talk. So the answer to the question is, how did the serpent communicate with Eve? I don't have any idea, and neither does anybody else. Uh, some people think that maybe that what we experience with our pets today is a shadow of what was once a reality, and maybe human beings and animals could talk, but I don't know. But you read Genesis 3, and the emphasis is not on how they communicated, but on what they talked about. You see this in Genesis 2, God puts them in this garden, and he says there's, there's only one rule you have to follow, basically one rule. Now, in our culture, we've got rules for everything. We've got laws for everything. We pay people to enforce the law. We vote for people to change the law. We've got lawyers and, and judges and juries to help us navigate the law. But, but in that time period, at the beginning, there was just one law, and it was this. There's this tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and you don't touch it. You don't eat anything from it, you don't touch it, and that's your law. Now, now, keep in mind that Adam and Eve are living in paradise. I mean, everywhere they look, they got more trees, there's more fruit being produced than they could ever possibly eat, but there was something about the fact that they weren't supposed to touch that one tree that sort of drew them in. You know how it is, somebody tells you not to do something and you're determined to do it, well, that, that's what happened. 
And Satan shows up. New Testament tells us it was Satan who took possession of that serpent, and he initiates this conversation with Eve. And what you see here is a good example of how Satan operates. As soon as he starts talking, he tries to cast doubt in Eve's mind on God's intentions. So verse 1, he comes up, he says, did God really say you're not supposed to eat any fruit from any tree in the garden? And Eve immediately catches on because that's not at all what God said. God said, you got all these trees, there's just one tree that you're not supposed to eat from. But Satan twists God's words. He's a, he's a master manipulator, and he, he skillfully convinces Adam and Eve that the one rule that God had given them for their own protection was really a restriction on their freedom, and that's what Satan does. Andy Stanley's got a great series that some of you have been through called Guardrails, and then he talks about how when you're driving down the highway and you see these guardrails, you don't think much about it. You know, you just know they're there. You don't take pictures of the guardrails. You don't, you don't call anybody and say, you know, these guardrails are so nice. The, the guardrails are there simply to keep you in the lines. They're there to keep you from, from driving over a cliff. And if you hit a guardrail, it might hurt. You know, it might damage your car, might give you a whiplash, but it's a lot better than going over the cliff. And then what Andy Stanley says, I think this is true, that those commandments in the Bible are simply guardrails. They're not there to restrict your freedom. If you want to go over the cliff, you can go over the cliff, but they're there to protect you and keep you from having your life go completely off the rails. So when God gives them this, this one command, it's not to restrict their freedom. It's to keep them from, from blowing everything up. That's the way it is with God's commands. They're not there to, to limit our freedom but to protect us. But Satan somehow loves to convince us that God is, is holding stuff back from us. So he comes to Eve and he says, you know, what, what do you mean that God said you, you're going to die if you eat from that? You're, you're not going to die. What's going to happen is God's just trying to hold you down. And if you'll just eat the fruit from that tree, your eyes will be open and you'll see everything you need to see and you'll be just like God and he won't be able to tell you what to do anymore. He's just trying to hold you back. That's what Satan does. And at that moment, Adam and Eve have a choice to make. Just think about it. Here they are, literal paradise, living in the most beautiful place, perfect harmony. Everybody's getting along. Life is, is as it was designed to be, but God, being the father that he is, gives them a choice. Make sure you understand this. They were not programmed like robots for perfect obedience. Just like us. God said, I'm going to let you make the decision. Here, here's the deal. I mean, here's what I've provided for you. But if you want to walk away, I'm going to let you do that. And unfortunately for you and me, they made the wrong choice. So the question is, what is, what is sin? Most of the time, we talk about sin. We don't even like to use the word. We'd much rather say, I made a mistake. I had a lapse in judgment. I messed up. I misspoke. I uh, went to the wrong place. I made a bad decision. I reacted badly. We don't even like to use that word sin. In the New Testament, there's a word that gets translated as sin that comes from the, the world of archery. And it's this idea that God's put this target over here, and you did your best, and somehow you, you missed the target. You, you missed the mark. And that's not wrong, but what you read in, in Genesis, Genesis 3 is the idea of sin actually goes deeper than that. It's not just that you, you missed the mark. It's not just that you, you knew there was this bullseye, there was this, this standard that you're supposed to hit, and you came up short. It's not that. It's that you, you missed the mark on purpose. It's that God said, here's what I want you to do, and you chose to go the opposite direction. It's making a conscious decision that even though God's given you a standard, you choose to violate that standard. Remember that, that song Frank Sinatra used to sing, uh, I did it my way. Anybody remember that? That's what sin is. There's God's way and there's your way, and you make a choice to do it your way. So what is sin? At the most basic level, it's rebellion against God. The great writer R.C. Sproul said it like this, sin is cosmic treason. It's an act of supreme ingratitude toward the one to whom we owe everything to the one who has given us life itself. 1 John 3, the Apostle John says this, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Sin is saying to the world and to yourself, hey, I know what God says, but I'm gonna do it my way. 
I'm going to choose to follow my own rules. I'm not going to permit, I'm not going to uh, submit myself to the, the things that are there for my own protection. I'm going to view God's laws as restrictions, and I'm going to rebel against his authority and do whatever it is that I think is going to, to make me happy. Check out verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Now, let me stop here a minute. A lot of times, old preachers would make a big deal out of this. It was Eve. It was the woman's fault. But, but you know how it is. Most of the guys won't admit this, but you know it's true. Uh, when something goes wrong, as guys, our tendency is to blame our wife. You know what I mean? Uh, something didn't go right. It has to be her fault because it couldn't be our fault. But you read in the Hebrew, and the way it's constructed, it lets us know that Adam was there the whole time. It's not like Eve was over here somewhere and Adam was caught by surprise. He was standing there watching. And at any moment, he could have spoke up and said, you know, I'm not sure this is a great idea, but he doesn't do that. He chooses the path of least resistance. He, he chooses passivity rather than leadership. And he allows something to happen that never should have happened. And then you get to verse 7, and everything changes. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. In one dramatic moment, everything is different. The, the perfect harmony that they'd enjoyed is now broken. The unity and the intimacy that had been theirs in their relationship is now broken. It vanishes. And, and starting in verse 7 through the rest of this chapter, it, Moses describes what's happened to the world. It's the beginning stages of what you see today when you turn on the news or open up a newspaper and this is the moment when everything goes off the rails and here's the really scary part the same disease that affected Adam and Eve has been handed down to us it's part of our, our spiritual DNA Romans 5 Paul says it like this therefore just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin in this way death came to all people because all sinned the same stuff that got Adam and Eve in trouble is a part of your DNA. So this is a story not just about what happened to them. This is a story about what happened to us. Well, Romans 3 says all of us have sinned. All of us are guilty. All of us have been infected with this disease that, that inclines us to choose the wrong thing over the right thing. Your parents handed it down to you. You handed it down to your kids. That's why you never have to teach your kid to be, uh, you never have to teach your kid to be selfish. You ever notice that? You don't have to teach your kid how to tell a lie. You don't have to teach your kid to rebel against authority. All of that comes naturally. What you have to teach your kids is how to be unselfish, how to be honest, how to submit to authority. There, there's something within us, there's something in our spiritual DNA that causes us to be naturally selfish, naturally rebellious, and we have to fight against it. Mark Twain, the great writer, said, we're all like the moon. We have a dark side. And man, is that ever true. Deep inside all of us, there is this inclination to do the wrong thing. There is this natural attraction to things that are bad for us. That's why God gives us these commands, these guardrails, to keep us from blowing up our lives. But it's a constant battle. Starting in verse 8, you see some of the consequences of the fall, some of the results. There's a lot of them here. I'm just going to mention uh, five of them briefly. Here's the first one, spiritual separation. Check out verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Verse 11, and he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? So we talked about this some last week. Adam and Eve are in this garden, and the way it works is every evening God would, would come down from heaven. He would just sort of hang out with them. Can you imagine you know, what that would be like? You work all day, and then you, you hang out with God in the evening. That's the way it's a picture you get. But on this particular night, God shows up, and they don't feel like hanging out. All of a sudden, rather than, than running towards God, they're trying to, to hide from God. A couple years ago, there was a newspaper in London, England, 
uh, that encourage parents to uh, send in pictures of their kids as they were playing hide and seek. If you ever played hide and seek with your kids, you know they don't they don't always do the best job of hiding, right? Sometimes it's it's pretty poor. So I want to show you a couple pictures from this. Uh, I'm not going to show all, but here's one of them. Uh, here's a young lady that's hiding in her bedroom uh, at the end of her crib. Now, she's kind of got this blanket over her head, and I think the idea is, she, in her mind, she's thinking, well, if I can't see them, then they obviously can't see me, right? Let me show you another one. Same principle at work here. Here's a young man hiding behind the curtain in his living room. Same thought process. If I can't see them, they probably can't see me. Now, I got one more I want to show you. This is my favorite. Uh, this is a guy who's uh, hiding behind this, this pole here, and he can't see them, so he's convinced that, that they can't see him. Now, in my mind, this is what Adam must have looked like. I mean, here comes God. Can you imagine the absurdity of a guy who was created by God trying to hide from God behind a tree that God created? But in Adam's mind, he's thinking, well, if I can't see him, he probably can't see me. And we do the same thing. You ever notice that? You mess up, you make a bad decision, you sin, and, and instead of being comfortable in the presence of God like you once were, you begin to pull back. And you think, well, if I can't see God, then maybe God can't see me. And the whole time, God's got a perfect view. He sees everything. But that's what sin does. It builds a wall between us and God. Here's another consequence. Not only is there spiritual separation, there's relational conflict. Check out verse 12. The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. So God shows up and everybody starts blaming everybody else. Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the serpent. Nobody wants to take responsibility. And for the very first time in history, there's this relational break between this man and his wife. And from there, it just gets worse. I mean, you read the next chapter, they have these two boys, Cain and Abel. Cain gets jealous of Abel and he kills him and commits the very first murder. You keep reading, you get to Genesis 5. The world is now so dark. Everybody's at each other. Everybody's in conflict that God sends this flood and he starts over with just Noah's family. But you keep reading and what you find is that even, even a flood can't wipe away the stain of sin. It's a story that continues right up to today. Some of you have experienced that. Some of you lived in homes growing up in which a simple disagreement quickly became a nuclear explosion. Some of you may work in environments like that. One little thing, and somebody goes off, and everybody's at each other. Maybe you grew up in a family where things were, you know, were calm on the surface, but underneath there was always this fire raging that was stoked by resentment and bitterness and anger. Some of you may be living like that right now. And it all started right here. Here's another one. Physical pain. Uh, you get to verse 14, God talks about childbirth, but... That's just the start, verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will make your, chain, your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to your children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. The picture you get is that before the fall, Adam and Eve lived in this world that was free. There's no physical pain. There's no emotional pain. And you go and spend some time this week. You, you go down to the hospital and, and just walk around, and in every room, you'll see a living, breathing illustration of the result of the fall. Broken bones, cancer, dementia, Alzheimer's, heart disease, arthritis, addiction, back pain, headaches, asthma, depression, diabetes, addiction. None of those things, none of those things were a part of God's original plan. And yet what you find is that sin has messed everything up so deeply that even our bodies have been affected. Here's a fourth consequence, frustration. You ever had a bad day at work? You ever gone in and, you know, the voicemail's full, the computers won't work, there's more money going out than coming in, somebody doesn't show up, and it's just really difficult. Adam was the, the first person who ever experienced a bad day at work. Check this out, verse 17. 
To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you'll eat food from it all the days of your life. It'll produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you'll eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you'll return. Up until this point, it was like the ground was, was working with Adam, but not anymore. Even the environment has been thrown off because of sin. Weeds, erosion, volcanoes, tornadoes, tsunamis, earthquakes, climate change, bugs, rodents, all the things that, that make life hard started in Genesis chapter 3. Romans 5, Paul says that the creation itself is groaning under the weight of sin. All of your life, from the first breath to the final breath, there's going to be days of frustration. Now, thankfully, it's not every day, but there are going to be a few. There's one more, and it's by far the worst. The final consequence is death. Verse 19, he says, from dust you are and to dust you'll return. If you ever went to a cemetery, if you ever stood next to a casket of somebody you loved, if you ever said a premature goodbye to somebody that, that you wanted to hold on to, if you ever walked in a funeral home and you thought to yourself, boy, it was never supposed to be like this, you're right. This was never God's plan. But sin has messed up everything. Once you listen, I read something written by a guy named Paul David Tripp. Here's what he wrote. He said, in the beginning, life was better than anything we can imagine from our sin-scarred vantage point. But sadly, it didn't last long. In the most significant rebellious act ever committed, men and women stepped outside of God's ordained plan. In a second, it all came crashing down. In an instant, fear, guilt, and shame became standard human experiences. People who, were, who once lived in perfect harmony now accused, deceived, and fought for control. Weeds and disease became daily concerns. People began to desire what was evil and do what was wrong. Rather than submit to God's authority, they lived as their own gods. The world that once sang the song of perfection now groaned under the weight of the fall. Truth is, if you believe the story, if you believe what the Bible says, there's not one area of your life that hasn't been affected by sin. But make sure you understand this. It's not just Adam's sin that messed everything up. It's your sin and my sin that keeps messing it up. And if you to think about your life, you just go home today and just think about the areas of your life, maybe identify some areas where things aren't going real well, I can promise you that almost exclusively, I can almost guarantee that at the end of all that, at the bottom of all that, the, the root cause of all that is sin. It's rebellion against God. So what's the answer? So one thing to diagnose the problem, what's the cure? We'll talk about this more next week, but for now, let me just say this. The cure, the only cure, is a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it. You see hints of this throughout this passage. Verse 15, God points to this, this future showdown. He talks about the offspring of the woman and Satan are gonna be in this big showdown. That's what happened on the cross. But make sure you understand that he makes it clear that, that for a period of time, it's going to seem like Satan is winning. He says he will strike your heel. If you ever had your, your heel broken, if you ever broke a bone, you know that's painful, it's intense, but the good news is it's temporary. Nobody ever died from a broken bone. Nobody ever died from a broken heel. But the blow that Jesus delivered to Satan on the cross that day, that was fatal. He said, you will strike his heel and he will, will crush your head. It's fatal. Romans 5, here's what Paul says, but the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? You keep reading that passage and it says, where, great, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Yes, sin messed everything up. But Jesus came to reverse the effects of the curse in your life and in my life. 
From the very first moment that man fell, God put in motion a plan to bring us back home. So my favorite part of this whole story, Genesis 3, you go through it. My favorite verse, the one that's underlined and circled, is verse 9. I want to read this to you one more time. Remember, they've just eaten this fruit. It's now evening. God has shown up in the garden, and look at what happens. It says, but the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Here's what you have to remember. He already knew where he was. It's not like God showed up that night and he was surprised by everything that happened. He already knew. I mean, he knew that Adam and Eve had made the wrong choice. He knew they were hiding from him. And yet here's the thing. Even though he knew that they chose to walk away from the perfection that he offered, even though he knew that they made a conscious decision to reject his standards and to follow their own rules, he came anyway. And he invited them to come and hang out. A little later in the chapter, you read that after God sees their, the fig leaves that they've sewn together, he makes them their clothes for them. Some of you, as we went through that list, you could say, you know, that's my life. We'll talk about, you know, spiritual separation, check. Relational conflict, absolutely. Frustration, some, people, some of you are so frustrated you can't stand it. Physical pain, everything hurts. See, the cool thing about this story is this is not just some cool story about, you know, your long-lost ancestor. This is a story about you, and it's a story about me. And what you learn from this story is that in those moments when we're running as hard as we can away from God, rather than sit back and watch us run away, he chases after us. And for some of you here this morning, the best thing you could do would be to stop running. Because it's like God's behind you. And he's saying, where are you? I want you to stand. In just a moment, we're going to sing a song that you're familiar with. The song is, is Good, Good Father. In Genesis 3, you get a picture of what a good father looks like. Some of you may be like me. Maybe you grew up and you didn't have the, the best example. But you read through Genesis 2, and then you get to Genesis 3, and you see a great picture of what a good father really looks like. A bad father... A bad father sees your sin and they want to remind you of it. Uh, they want to beat you up. They want to call you in and just beat you over the head with it and make sure you know what a, how messed up you are, what a disgrace you are, but not a good father. A good father sees you and instead of beating you over the head with it, they call you back home. A bad father holds it against you. They'll be reminding you of stuff you did wrong for years into the future. They don't want you to forget, but a good father comes in and they, they cover you in grace. A bad father kicks you out of the house, but a good father invites you back in. Let's pray. Father, when we look at the world, we know it's a messed up place. And Lord, sometimes in moments of clarity, when we look in the mirror, we know our heart is a messed up place. But Lord, we're thankful that in spite of the bad decisions, in spite of the selfish ambition, in spite of sin, you invite us to come back home. So Lord, we pray that in these closing moments and in the days to come this week, that we would hear your voice, not a voice of condemnation, but a voice of love saying, where are you? Where are you going? And why don't you come home? Jesus' name.